Welcome to Mount Prospect Public Library's Library Life. I'm Kathy Cushing. Today we'll enjoy a mini performance by the Prospect High School Madrigals. We'll also visit with the author of Lightning Strikes and hear the inspiring story of Nikola Tesla. And we'll rediscover how much fun learning can be at the Kindergarten Clubhouse. But first, let's embrace the romance of flamenco as we peek in on our library's 2016 Cultural Series Festival Night. The Mount Prospect Public Library kicks off its 2016 cultural series focusing on Spain and the Spanish culture with Festival Night featuring a lively guitar ensemble. This particular ensemble has been together for about 15 years. Since it's called Las Guitares de España, the Guitars of Spain, you have this kind of Spanish guitar influence and the dance and associated cultures to go with it. Musician artist Carlo Basile and his partner Diego Alonso lead this talented ensemble through a diverse repertoire of classical, contemporary, and flamenco music. We're playing Spanish guitar music and we have a dancer, which is great, so you have a flamenco dancer. Uh, but the, the roots of flamenco come from India and from uh, the Middle East, from Baghdad, places like that. And so we'll also have uh, an Arabic oud player, and the oud is like a lute. It's like a, a European instrument, but it actually came from Baghdad first. And uh, it looks like a little bowl. It's kind of like the grandfather of the guitar. So we'll have that in instrument, as well as a, a talking drummer from Senegal. I have a master's degree in Spanish classical guitar, and uh, I not only went to Spain to study flamenco, which is more uh, folkloric music, let's say, from Spain, as opposed to the classical side, but I also, in the last uh, 15 years, have traveled to India and Africa and places like that to give me, a, I, I would say, a world music kind of a background with a Spanish guitar foundation. An artist with a passion for educating, Basile, explains the elements that make Spanish music unique. This is called the Andalusian cadence. It's so distinctive coming from the uh, Andalusia, of the south of Spain, that uh, to me, that kind of is the foundation for all of this. Uh, with a flamenco dancer, we might play some things that are more percussive that go with the dance. So if she's doing. That could go with the heel work that she's doing. So we're still playing the sounds, but there's uh, more rhythmic elements to it when there's a dancer. Each fall, Festival Night traditionally sets the stage for a month-long series of cultural events, funded through the generosity of the Elizabeth J. Clue Memorial Fund. Especially at a library or places where people are wanting information, they want the context. They don't just want to hear the music. They want to understand, well, how does this fit into the bigger picture, you know? And hopefully through our music, we're getting people to see that, look, there are a lot of things going on in other cultures that, are, that you really need to know about, and then you open up the dialogue, and before you know it, there's less fear and more like, hey, let's celebrate what we have. At times, just listening to the life story, talents, or ingenuity of one person can help us to spark up the resourcefulness within. Joining me today on Library Life to discuss his library event, Lightning Strikes, Tesla, Creativity, and the Soul of Innovation is author, speaker, and journalist John Wasik. Welcome. Thanks for having me. John, I'd like to start out by talking a little bit about your professional background. Well, I've been writing uh, for about 30 years. It'll be 30 years next year. Hmm. Um, this is my 16th book, and uh, mostly what I do is I, I write for a number of publications. I'm a contributor to the New York Times, uh, to Forbes, and uh, I do a column on college planning for CBS Market Watch. Wow. Now, most of your books uh, deal with uh, finance, investments, life planning. Um, why did you decide to write a book about Nikola Tesla? Well, about 11 years ago, I wrote a book called The Merchant of Power. Mm -hmm. and it was about Samuel Linsell, who was the, the sort of the father of Commonwealth Edison, the electrical grid. Uh, and it was just after the dot-com crash, and I, I was kind of in the mood for a biography, and all my other books on finance and retirement were just kind of were not going anywhere. <laughs> so uh, I wrote this book about insulin, and, and toward the end of my research, I discovered this one letter in the archives 
of Loyola University of all places mm -hmm. from Nikola Tesla to Insel saying, could you finance this new project that I have underfoot? Now at the time, historically, both men were financially ruined. So Insel was in no position to help Tesla, but it, it mentioned a few things in that letter that intrigued me for about a decade. Mm -hmm. and, and I wrote a, a lot of different books since. There's been another couple of market crashes, a recession, um, and, and I, I really couldn't get away from the subject. So I really wanted to know what Tesla was all about, and there was there were all sorts of things connected to him, a death ray, um, you know, he was the inventor of alternating current, of robotics, mm -hmm. and once you find all these other little stories, you, you, you say to yourself, well, let's tell the big story, but let's tell it in a different way. So that's, that's really what brought me to that. It truly is a fascinating topic. For those of us who are not necessarily familiar with Tesla, tell us a little bit about his life story and his accomplishments. Sure. He was born in 1856. Uh, in an area roughly described as the Aust Austro-Hungarian Empire, sort of on the, the frontier as they call it. Now, if you ask people today, the Croatians will call him one of them. The Serbians say he's an ethnic Serb. So there's a lot of people who claim him. And whenever right. I get this question, I just say he's a man of the world. Mm -hmm. And um, he, he grew up um, in a family. His father was a Serbian Orthodox priest, wanted him to become a priest. Uh, and then he decided that it wasn't going to work out for him and he wanted to become an engineer. So he studied at some of the best engineering schools in Europe, uh, ended up working for Continental Edison, uh, which was Thomas Edison's uh, company in Europe. He was working in Paris and then he was recommended Edison. Uh, came over to work for Edison as, as well, a, a glorified fixer-upper. <laughs> uh, he had to fix one of Edison's uh, power plants and did so. Uh, he was only there for a few months, but had in his head this whole idea of, of what alternating current was. That is, a major system of transporting electrons over long distances. Mm -hmm. And he managed to do this system with Westinghouse after he left Edison, and, and then the rest was history. Also the father of robotics and the real inventor of radio, uh, and really pioneered this whole idea of wireless transmission of power. Um, after he created his AC system, he was the first engineer to wire Niagara Falls. Uh, he was doing things a hundred years ago that we're still talking about today. Obviously a man ahead of his time. Oh yes, very much so. So tell me, did he ever encounter roadblocks to his genius? Oh, absolutely. He had numerous mental breakdowns. Uh, he was, he was a, a tremendous workaholic. He just kind of worked until he fell apart, which is <laughs> something I could recommend to future inventors. Uh, but, you know, he had a lot of financial setbacks after he tried to do his, what he called the world system of wireless power. Um, he had funding from J.P. Morgan, and when Marconi was able to get a signal across the Atlantic with his technology, mm -hmm. um, Morgan decided to back Marconi and took his money away from Tesla. And it's, it's not like it is today where you can crowdfund a project, and he, he was really financially destitute for the most part the rest of his life, but still coming up with ideas. So that was a huge roadblock. Mm -hmm. uh, also, he was hit by a car. He had to recover from that. Um, he, had, he had numerous other problems. But I think the important story about Tesla that he was constantly reinventing, having visions of, of what the future could be with technology, was very much a pacifist in the world peace and in using technology for you know really improving the human condition. Now, John, Lightning Strikes contains never-before-published interviews and archives. How did you go about doing the research on this book? Oh, gosh, I had to do, oh, I don't know, about a half a dozen different Freedom of Information Act requests, the FBI, the National Archives, the Pentagon. A lot of those were not even answered, but uh, I had to dig into the National Archives a number of different fronts. Mm -hmm. uh, there was also Loyola University. There's the Westinghouse Archives in Pittsburgh, the Tesla Museum Archives in Belgrade, Serbia, and a whole bunch of different other places. But uh, basically, you have to sort through a thousand documents to get one that's really going to talk to you. Because you're trying to tell the story of, well, did he ever do this? Or was this real? Or was this tr you know, not true? Mm -hmm. There's a lot of real apocryphal information of what he did or didn't do. Um, and the only way you can prove or disprove that this is through an eyewitness and they're all dead. 
or through archival research and finding the documents, and, and that took a long time. John, you are to a certain extent a motivational speaker. How do you feel your book and the story of Tesla can help spark interest and creativity in others? Well, I think that what we really need right now is, is sort of a lens for innovation, a way of harnessing our talents. And, and I really think that everybody is creative in some way. And somewhere along the line in school or, or, or in, in different situations, we're told, don't scribble, don't doodle, don't play around, don't take that apart. And, and, it's, and it's, it's in a way suppressing our natural creative urges. So what I wanted to do in this book is to use Tesla's life and work mm -hmm. as sort of a way to focus ourselves on what we need to do. And, and just the process of writing this, I had so many different roadblocks and setbacks and lost my agent, lost people I loved. And you know, it's just, life happens, right? Right. So a lot of it I learned along the way is like, yeah, you do have to reinvent yourself. There really is no job with your name on it sitting out there for you. So you really have to think creatively. You have to visualize what you want to do and, and really be true to your own talents. Mm -hmm. Really be honest about what you can bring to the world. And that's, that's some of the advice component. It's a weird book because I'm doing history, I'm doing biography, and there's, there's a lot of advice on how to really get at the soul of innovation. I thought Tesla was really the story that tells us how to do it. Well, it sounds fascinating. I'd like to end our interview by talking a little bit about some future innovations that we might see that could be attributed to Tesla. Oh, absolutely. So the big ticket right now is to find a way of transporting power, clean power, renewable power, wirelessly. That was his dream more than 100 years ago. There's, there's various attempts to doing this, and there's a little baby step, so you can be able to charge your, your cell phone wireless, or wirelessly at Starbucks. You can do all sorts of things with your cell phone that, that he kind of predicted. Mm -hmm. So all that is kind of shifting into almost the mainstream of technological progress, not quite there yet. You know, a lot of engineering needs to be done. But if we could, say, take solar energy from outer space, have these huge solar rays in space, beam them down to Earth, we have 24 seven clean power. But engineering it is, is, is the key step in, in harnessing our creativity to do it. Wonderful, thank you so much for being with me today. Thank you for having me. If you would like more information regarding lightning strikes, Tesla creativity, and the soul of innovation, or any upcoming Mount Prospect Public Library event, contact the library at area code 847-253-5675 or visit our website at www.mppl.org. Kindergarten Clubhouse is an ongoing after-school series here in the library's youth department. Let's join in the fun as youngsters find themselves immersed in school tales. Stories, songs, crafts, and snacks. Mount Prospect Public Library's Kindergarten Clubhouse contains all these ingredients, served up on a friendly platter of educational fun. Kindergarten Clubhouse is a great um, after-school program that we offer most months during the school year um, for those in kindergarten. That's a great way to kind of build upon, you know, those skills that they're using while they attend kindergarten, especially those literacy skills, but then we're also working on enrichment. Um, we work on a craft, um, we watch a short movie, and we even have a snack. So it's um, building on those early literacy skills, but also um, providing some fun and enrichment in an after-school environment. Youth Services Assistant Amy Murda is part of a team of library staff members facilitating this special monthly event designed especially for kindergartners. It's a big transition year since they're now in a school setting. Some of them might be in full day kindergarten, so that could be a big adjustment coming from preschool. Always a kindergarten clubhouse, we want to keep it light and fun while providing um, opportunities to use um, to build those literacy skills. Um, we have a funny book we're going to read called um, Is Your Buffalo Ready for Kindergarten? And then we also like to dive into some great nonfiction picture books like uh, Panda Kindergarten, which actually talks about um, pandas, how they actually go to a kind of school to learn important skills, which is what these kindergartners are also doing every day. <laughs> 
a lot of our crafts are, you know, literacy and book related. So today we're actually making a fun bookmark and um, we want to keep pushing those literacy skills. So um, we have um, different letters they're going to choose to put on their bookmarks and then they can customize it the whatever way they'd like. Young participants enjoy the social atmosphere inherent in a clubhouse while reaping a number of age-appropriate educational benefits. You know, regardless of not if um, the kindergartner is in a traditional school environment or getting um, their schooling from home for their kindergarten year, they can come to the library and have a free program that enriches their child and provides them in a 45 minute program where you're not only, you know, getting an age appropriate kindergarten story time, we're also, you know, working on, you know, fine motor skills with the craft. And then we're also, you're also getting that social interaction too with other kids your age. And that's what our youth services department is here for, to serve the community and support the school. So by providing enrichment programs like this, we really are supporting those students um, because we want them to do well in school and we want them to love and enjoy and have fun reading. And so all of our programs here in youth services, we really want to promote that. The programs and materials available here in the Youth Services Department encourage children to develop and nurture their love for reading. And the staff here has a knack for making education fun. Let's find out what Youth Outreach Coordinator Claire Bartlett has chosen as her best book pick from this department. This is the story of Milo Speck, accidental agent, a boy whose father travels a lot for work and leaves him with grandmother, a woman who is not actually his grandmother, and who makes him wear dorky clothes with squawking ducks on them. He's emptying out the laundry machine one day when a sock pulls him in. Suddenly, he's in a world called Ogregon, filled with, you guessed it, ogres. They are giant, not very smart, and obsessed with eating children. Milo is desperate for a way to escape until he hears that his father might be trapped there as well. So he goes to rescue his father and learns along the way about secret agents, turkeys that obey commands, the mysterious Dr. L, and something called a what's it that promises to bring the ogres lots of kids to eat. This book is exciting and explores worlds very different from our own, but it should also make you laugh. If you're looking for something magical with a sense of humor, check out this book. Recommendations from the Youth Services Department this month serve up fantasy with a side of humor. In My Diary from the Edge of the World by Jody Lynn Anderson, a family searches for an extraordinary world where they can be safe from harmful magic. The Menagerie by Tutti and Carrie Sutherland centers around a 12-year-old boy who wakes up to discover a baby griffin hiding under his bed and suddenly finds himself thrown into a magical mystery. In Small Persons with Wings by Ellen Boreham, a family of fairy guardians becomes involved in a series of magical adventures as they search for a missing ring. The Hero's Guide to Saving Your Kingdom by Christopher Healy focuses on a new kind of fairy tale where the Prince Charmings take center stage, working with their princesses to save the kingdom from a witch. And in Only You Can Save Mankind by Terry Pratchett, a boy escapes into a video game about an alien war where he determines that the aliens are real and need his help to survive. Recommendations from the Adult Services Department this month are social commentaries dealing with time travel. The Man Who Folded Himself by David Gerald revolves around a person who discovers he is continually reliving his life over in increasingly small increments until the day he dies. Kindred by Octavia Butler is the story of a black woman who finds herself repeatedly transported to Antebellum South, where she fights to ensure the survival of her ancestry. In The Time Traveler's Wife by Audrey Niffenegger, two people manage to find love while randomly jumping back and forth through time. Outlander by Diana Gabaldon tells the romantic and adventurous tale of a nurse who was accidentally transported back in time to 18th century Scotland. And The Alienist by Caleb Carr is an intriguing romance set in 1896 New York, where a proto-psychologist tracks down a serial killer. 
Finally, here's business reference librarian Joe Collier with his best book pick from the Adult Services Department. Time and Again by Jack Finney. Simon Cy Morley is an illustrator in late 1960s New York, not quite unhappy, but wondering if there could be more to his satisfactory, if mundane, life. Then Cy is recruited by a shadowy, unofficial government group secretly working on a project to send agents back in time to observe and possibly alter history. In 1882 New York, Cy tries to discover the circumstances behind the curious suicide of a prominent businessman while falling in love with fellow boarder Julia. This meticulously researched novel straddles fantasy and historical fiction using an uncomplicated time travel plot device to stage detailed historical descriptions. The author's use of illustrations, paintings, and photographs is cleverly incorporated into the plot, adding an unusual but interesting twist on the first-person narrative. While the book takes its time establishing the context and method for time travel, the leisurely pace picks up as romantic and other mystery-related developments begin to drive the plot. Ideal for readers who enjoy love stories with a historical and or fantasy bent with a particular interest in historical New York. One of my favorite traditions at this time of the year is enjoying the Prospect Madrigals Holiday Concert. Let's go over to the high school right now and peek in as they rehearse for what has become an annual library event. Days come, days go, we try to take the time to Prospect High School with choir director Jennifer Triano. Hi, Jen. Hi, Kathy. We just heard a wonderful a cappella performance. Tell us a little bit about the 2016 2017 Prospect Madrigals. Right. This year we have 14 Madrigals in our group. Um, and the song that you just heard was Love Psalm. And it's actually not a magical piece. It's a 20th century piece um, written by Darman Meter, who is a jazz musician. But it's just a piece that really. Um, just tells a lovely story and we really enjoy singing it. Well, obviously, we've got a lot of talent here at Prospect mm -hmm. High School. So how do you select the certain singers that you do? It's a very difficult process. Um, it needs to be singers who blend well together, who sing well together, their timbres um, mix well together. So it, it's, it's kind of a detailed process. For those of us who might not be familiar with madrigals, mm -hmm. tell us a little bit about the tradition of this type of singing. Oh, sure. Madrigals began the 14th century in Italy. Um, there used to be two to six singers. It's secular music and it's a cappella. And then through the 17th century, madrigals spread throughout Europe and became different versions of the Italian madrigal. Okay, now we are going to end up 
with a Christmas selection. Mm -hmm. So tell us a little bit about what you've decided to sing today. Right, so our song is called The Holly and the Ivy, and um, most historians think it's a pagan song that began, began a thousand years ago. And um, in the 19th century, the Christian church or Catholic church turned it more into a Christmas holiday tune. Well, it sounds wonderful, and I thank you so much for putting together this mini concert every year for us. Thank you, we look forward to it too. And now, here are the Prospect Madrigals. Prospect Medical Holiday Concert is just one example of the many entertaining, informational, and educational events featured here at the Mount Prospect Public Library every month. Don't miss any library programs you'd like to experience. Here's a list of events scheduled in November and December. Reservations are strongly recommended. For more information regarding these events, call area code 847-2535675 or visit our website at www.mppl.org. You will also find a listing and description of all upcoming Mount Prospect Public Library events in your library newsletter preview. Tis the season when a simple melody can summon happy thoughts or warm memories. With this in mind, our Library Life camera today asks the question, what is your favorite holiday song and why? Here are some responses. Um, my favorite song is God Rest Ye Merry Gentlemen. It's an English old song. It brings back a lot of good memories. Oh, come all ye faithful, hark the herald, anything. I like Silent Night and because uh, my mom used to sing it to me when we were young. That wraps up this edition of Library Life. We here at the Mount Prospect Public Library wish you and your family a happy and healthy holiday season. For more information on any of the Mount Prospect Public Library's services and events highlighted here, call area code 847-2535675 or visit our website at www.mppl.org.